Good morning again. I'm going to be reading from Paul's epistle to Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, you who are enthroned above the heavens, who know all things, we thank you for your word. We pray that we would be enlightened by it today, that we might become more like Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today marks a turning point in the teaching here at Christ Church Leavenworth. For the past several months, we've been doing topical messages on the tools for Christian living. As you know, we covered worship, we covered confession and repentance, we covered music and work, we covered joy, and last week we covered Christian education. And last week, we came to the end of those topics. The elders here at Christ Church decided to do a series on a short book first from the New Testament and later from the Old. So today, we're going to start a series on the letter to Titus, which I just read the greeting of. It's a very pertinent study, as you will see. It, it is timely because it addresses church leadership, which is always an important topic. It also addresses the necessity of sound doctrine for the defense of the faith against unbelievers and false teachers. And there are practical um, suggestions for Christian living for young and old, male and female. Sounds like something we need in the 21st century, doesn't it? But it wasn't written last year. It was most likely written sometime between 62 and 64 AD. Let me give you some historical context on that. Jesus was probably born in 4 BC and was crucified about AD 30. The Emperor Augustus, Caesar Augustus, died in 14 AD. So he was emperor when Jesus was born, but Tiberius was the emperor of Rome when Christ died. Nero became emperor in 54 AD at the age of 17. And the great fire of Rome was in 64. By that time, Nero had been emperor for 10 years. The Great Fire, as you probably know, set off the first wave of persecution of the Christians. Nero wanted to blame somebody for the fire, which he probably set, but he wanted to blame somebody and it was the Christians. And that's most likely when Paul, the author of this letter to Titus, died. According to tradition, he was beheaded by the Romans. So the letter to Titus that we're going to be going over was written just a few years before the end of Paul's life. For further context, Paul's first letter in Scripture was probably the letter to the Galatians, written between 49 and 50 AD. And Paul's crowning achievement, the letter to the Romans, was written between 55 and 57. So, who is Titus? Well, he's not mentioned in the book of Acts at all. Even though there are many clues in Paul's letters that he accompanied Paul, not sure why Luke left him out, but he did. Obviously, God had a reason for it. Chronologically, Titus is first mentioned in the book to, to the Galatians, the letter to the Galatians. There he is said to have accompanied Paul to Jerusalem for the council of church leaders in Acts 15. Then he's mentioned several times in 2 Corinthians, as well as, as, well as in Paul's letter to Timothy. What do we know of Titus? He was a Greek, a fellow worker with Paul, he was so honest and dependable that Paul entrusted him with the Corinthians collection for the saints that was to be taken to the saints in Judea. It appears that like Paul, 
He did not take reimbursement for his work in ministry. The reason there is a book in the Bible that bears his name is that Paul left him in charge of the churches on Crete to put them in order. This letter is a summary of what Paul told Titus to do on Crete. Now, the next interesting thing about all of this is that in the book of Acts, Paul only visits Crete once, and that's during his voyage to Rome. He'd already completed three missionary journeys by that point, and when he returned to Jerusalem at the end of the third missionary journey, he was put under arrest by the Romans and eventually sent to Rome to Caesar for judgment. All of that is in the latter part of the book of Acts. When the ship that he was on got to Crete, an island south of Greece in the Mediterranean, Paul prophesied that they should spend the winter in harbor there. Otherwise, the ship would be lost. Turns out ship captains don't listen to prisoners. And they were shipwrecked, as recorded in Acts 27. So Paul didn't spend much time on Crete during that journey. He is not recorded as having established churches there. And because of this, and some hints in other letters, like the letters to Timothy and later writings like to Philemon, Paul is said to have had a fourth missionary journey, which is not recorded in the book of Acts. That means that he was released from imprisonment in Acts 28. He went on a journey. Some people think he went to Spain, as he hoped to, if you read the end of the book of Romans. And then he went to Crete. He left Titus there. He went to Ephesus, which is on the west coast of what is now Turkey, and he left Timothy there. Then he went to Macedonia, which is north of Greece, and then he went to the west coast of Greece to a city called Nicopolis. Sometime after that, Paul was taken back to Rome, and there he died under the Neronian persecutions. Why do I bring all of this up? Well, history is interesting, and I like history. That's one reason. History is always going towards an ending point, leading to a goal, and that is a Christian concept. The podcast guys talk about this all the time. To the Christian, history is not circular. It doesn't just endlessly repeat itself over and over and over again. It is moving to the end of the entire world, being under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul is part of that, and so are each one of us here. Our deeds won't be remembered forever like Paul's. But the fact that Paul did one more missionary journey that's not recorded in Scripture tells us that even some of his work was not to be remembered forever. That doesn't make it unimportant, just like it doesn't make what we do every day unimportant. Whatever is being done for the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom is building stones into a solid foundation. There's another reason history is important. Like all the rest of scripture, literary criticism, what's called higher criticism of the last 200 years, looks skeptically at the letter to Titus. Because the events are not in the book of Acts, some people don't think that Paul actually wrote them. They think the letter to Titus, along with the letters to Timothy, were written a couple generations later by a deceiver they call pseudo-Paul. These same skeptics say that the problems of Titus and Timothy, the pastoral epistles as they are called, reflect the third generation church, not the early church of the book of Acts. They even call this the bourgeois church. Sounds kind of like the Russian Revolution, doesn't it? Other reasons given for doubting that Paul is the author of the epistle to Titus include supposed differences in language and differences in theology from Paul's other letters. I'm going to read Romans chapter 1, the first seven verses for you. And keep in mind what I read in Titus a few minutes ago. So this is Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles 
for his name's sake, among whom you were also the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I ask you, Does that sound different from Titus 1, the first four verses that I read earlier? I mean, sure, it sounds a little different, but do they sound theologically different? I mean, you, if you notice, there were a lot of the same themes running through them. Do they sound like two distinct people using different language styles wrote those two letters? Of course they don't. Sure, there's unique phrases in each letter, but if you were writing a letter to your wife, would it be different from one that you wrote to your grandmother? Of course it would. The main reason for questioning Paul's authorship of First and Second Timothy and Titus is to doubt that the Bible is what it says it is and to doubt the God of the Bible. Another reason is because people of our age do not like the message. As you'll see, Titus talks about godly roles of men and women. When the question of leadership comes up, only men are included, and this grates on moderns. People in the 21st century, including most evangelicals, don't like to be told what they can and cannot do. Two decades ago, this question was commonly brought up and, and people didn't like, the, uh, especially the feminists didn't like um, the pastoral epistles because um, they wanted women in the pulpit. That's obviously gone way past, way by the wayside in the past two decades. And now it's a question of whether or not you want homosexuals in the pulpit. So it's not really a question of whether or not the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. It's a question of not wanting to obey it. So why do I even bother bringing all this up? I could have said, to quote the New Geneva Study Bible, there is no real question that Paul wrote this letter. I could have said that and let it go at that. It would have made the sermon much shorter, which would have made lots of people happier. I mention it because I think it strengthens our faith. The Christian faith is being hounded on all sides. I don't need to tell you that. People appear to be leaving it in droves, at least in Western culture. Sometimes you might wonder if there's some truth to their criticism of Christianity. Or you'll hear an unbeliever say categorically, everyone knows Paul didn't write the pastoral epistles. Sometimes you wonder, maybe the Bible isn't really what we Christians believe it is. Maybe it isn't really relevant to modern society. It can be, get pretty lonely on this desert island called Christianity, surrounded by shark-infested waters. So I wanted to give you a taste of the authorship controversy so you can know just how silly it is. Of course Paul wrote this letter. The language is pretty darn similar. The theology sounds the same. If the letter was written for a third-generation middle-class church, why does Polycarp, a second-generation disciple of the Apostle John, why does he quote it? Now, the real issue is that a lot of Christians in the West, and especially in the U.S., want to be on the Christian island, but they want to dip their, show, their toes in the shark-infested waters. Some even want to swim with the sharks and think that they can go back to the island every Sunday morning for an hour. You can't dip your toes in water with sharks. You can't swim with sharks unless you want to get eaten. Or unless you want to become a shark. That's where the analogy breaks down. As you'll see going through Titus, how to deal with sharks on the island is a big concern of Paul's. All that by way of introduction. Today I'm going to cover the greeting of the letter, the first four verses as I've read. The next time we cover Titus, the subject of leadership will be discussed in more detail. And later, as I've already said, there'll be comments on the necessity of sound doctrine for the putting off of false teachers. And there'll be a discussion of the practical outworking of sound doctrine. So, let's look at the first four verses in Titus. Like letters written at the time, the first word states the name of the letter writer, Paul, who then identifies himself as a slave and as an apostle. In his greeting, Paul hits on some big theological concepts. We could easily spend a sermon message on each of them. Right off the bat, call Paul, Paul sorry, I get 
the C and the P mixed up. Paul calls the people of Christ the elect, the chosen ones. Funny, he sounds like a Calvinist, 1,500 years before Calvin. The Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy that uh, KJ read for us earlier shows that uh, this concept of the election of God didn't start with Calvin. It goes all the way back to Moses. I guess that means Moses was a Calvinist also. He states also that faith is based on knowledge and that true knowledge, true faith, leads to godliness. He says that our hope is in eternal life, which God revealed long ago. He equates God the Father and Christ the Savior, thus proclaiming the deity of Christ and anticipating the doctrine of the Trinity. And more. Like I said, we could go over those a lot. But I'm going to concentrate on just two points. First, Paul calls himself a bondservant of God. The word is translated a couple different ways, but the basic meaning is that Paul is a slave of God, a servant. Slaves do the will of their master, whether they like it or not. And they don't do the will of other masters. Paul, as a slave of God, also calls himself an apostle. And he sets himself up as an example of being a servant minister. Be imitators of me, he tells the Corinthian church. Calling himself a slave will also call Titus, as well as the elders that Titus is going to established for the Cretan church to the role of servant. James and Peter in their letters also call themselves slaves of God as well as apostles. Of course, the ultimate servant is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark 10, two of Jesus' disciples who would become apostles, the pillars of the church, foolishly ask Jesus that they be allowed to sit on either side of him when he comes in his glory. They are Oh, Jesus admonishes these two that only those who are servants will be great in his kingdom. They are not to be as the Gentile rulers, exercising authority and lording it over their charges. They are to be servants. Jesus even demonstrates this servanthood at the Last Supper in John's Gospel when he washes the disciples' feet. In the ancient world, there were not many more nasty jobs that were nastier than washing somebody else's feet which is why they had slaves that did it. And yet, that's what Jesus did for the disciples. The Lord of glory did that. As Jesus tells them in Mark 10, he did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul, as he does in many of his letters, also calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. Calvin says that this is Paul's way of of calling attention to his authority and lending that authority to Titus. An apostle was one chosen by Christ who was with him during the bulk of his earthly ministry. When an apostle is chosen to replace Judas in Acts 1, it had to be someone who had been with Christ from his baptism to his resurrection. The whole point was to be a witness to the resurrection. The word apostle means one that is sent with a message. So the apostles were to carry the message of Christ's resurrection to all the world. Paul was obviously chosen in a different way, which is why he calls himself an apostle untimely born in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. He was called by Jesus on the road to Damascus, which was mentioned at the end of the passage, the 2 Corinthians that KJ read. He was called to stop persecuting Jesus' people and rather to be a witness to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. His task as an apostle was to bear Christ's name, to tell of what Jesus had done. In Acts 9, when Jesus first confronts Paul, Jesus tells him how much he, Paul, must suffer for the name of Christ. And Paul tells the Corinthians in his second letter to that church, which we read this morning, what he did suffer for the name of Christ. He confirmed Jesus' words. This was a way of him defending his apostleship to the Corinthians. He suffered beatings. He suffered stonings. He suffered shipwrecks. He suffered imprisonment. It wasn't just Paul, either. 
James was martyred by Herod in Acts 12. Peter was martyred, according to tradition, by being crucified upside down. John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. This is what it took to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is what it took to be a servant of God. This is what authority in Christ's church looks like. It looks like serving others, washing their feet, or at least some equivalent to that. It means suffering su uh, physical hardships for Christ. Few of us know this kind of suffering or anything even approaching it. Maybe that's why there are so few true leaders in the church today. I want to get this clear right up front. The purpose of this letter 2,000 years ago was to get Titus to set up leaders in the church on Crete. And one of the reasons we are doing this short epistle is because we want to get men to start thinking about leadership in this church. Jill and I have been in enough church starts down through the years to know that leadership is all important. And we hope and pray for the men will, that God will call to be leaders of this church. But you have to understand that leadership ain't no picnic. It's not all sunshine and twittering birds. It means being a slave to God. And as I said, a slave only gets to serve one master. The elder in the church is to only serve God because there will be a time when he has to oppose certain men. There will be times when friendships will be lost for the sake of Christ. That's the way it must be. That's what mean being an elder, being a leader in Christ's church means. Makes you want to sign right up for the job, doesn't it? Why, you might ask, would anyone do this? Because, as Paul says in Philippians, I count all things as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. Why would anyone do this? Because there is no greater joy than serving the Lord Jesus. Because there is no greater work than serving for Christ's kingdom. Because there is no greater camaraderie than serving alongside others who also love the Lord Jesus and are working toward the same goal. And because they're called to it. If God calls a man to the ministry of elder, he also equips that man. Yes, I'm saying man. I touched on that earlier, but we'll get it right out front here again. This letter to Titus and the letters to Timothy make it pretty clear that elders are to be men. That's a hateful statement in the 21st century to people outside the church and to many inside the church. But I didn't make it up. I didn't just say it. God says it. It's right here in Titus. Remember in my introduction how I said that part of the authorship question was because people don't like the message of this letter. This is the point in all of this. This is where the rubber meets the road. But that's not really my point in this. My point in this is that the call of church leadership is a call to suffering. It is joyful suffering. It may not be suffering to the degree that the apostles suffered, but it is still suffering. Paul models that, and even more importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ models it. The next point I'd like to make is that there is an element of time in, Paul, in Paul's greeting. There is the hope of eternal life, time going on infinitely into the future. And God, according to this passage, promised eternal life from eternity past. My translation, the New American Standard, says long ages ago, which may actually be a better translation. As Calvin says, why would God promise eternal life to himself in eternity past? So, whatever, you can, you can decide on that. Nevertheless, God does promise eternal life, and he promised it from the beginning, according to Paul. The phrase I want to look at, though, is at the beginning of verse 3. Continuing the thought of the hope of eternal life, which was at the proper time manifested, even his word. This seems like an awkward phrase, but the basic thought is that God manifested his word at the proper time, at just the right time. The Greek word is logos, which I think is pronounced correctly, although I'm not sure, because penny, I know plenty of people who say Logos, and I know others who say Logos, so, but we know what I'm talking about, Logos. The word for word, does it refer to the word in Scripture or the word incarnate, Jesus Christ, or does it refer to both? 
If it refers to scripture, then it means that God's word came to us at just the right time. Even though the most recent parts of the Bible were written 2,000 years ago, it was written at just the right time for the people of God. On the other hand, Jesus, the word made flesh, is all through the Bible, either in promise form in the Old Testament or in actuality in the New which means that Jesus Christ came at just the right time also. Not too late, not too early, just right. Down through history, people have wondered why Christ did not come sooner to save some of the more ancient people. In my younger days, I liked rock music. And there was a rock opera, which most of you are too young to remember, called Jesus Christ Superstar. In it, the character of Judas wondered why Christ did not come in more modern times. As the quote goes, sorry, I have this quote running through my head in, in musical form all the time. If you'd come today, you could have reached a whole nation. Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. And that was 1970. That was before the internet. No, Jesus did not come too early, and he did not come too late. He came at just the right time, because God does everything with perfect timing. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So what does this mean? What did that mean to Titus on Crete? It meant that it was just the right time to bring order to the churches there, by ordaining elders, by encouraging the people in godliness, and by opposing false teachers. Later in this letter, Paul will tell Titus to come to him in Nicopolis when other men are sent to oversee the churches on Crete. Why? We don't know for sure, but Paul knew that his time was short, and he wanted to see Titus one more time. What does this time aspect mean for us? First, we can be assured that we are just the right people for the task that God wants us to accomplish. We are just the right people to be starting a church in Leavenworth, Kansas right now. God has blessed that effort, and we trust and hope that he will do so further, but we know that he will do it as he pleases. The elders and leaders here are going to start talking about starting a school to go along with the church. Please be praying that this is the right time to make that effort as well. We all may wish we lived at a different time, a time when the word was truly preached from every pulpit in town, when, when we could go to any church we wanted, and hear, the, and hear truth from the pulpit. There was a time like that. We may wish we lived in a time when we could send our children to schools that were already established without fear that the school teachers and administrators were mostly trying to destroy our children's faith. There was a time like that also, but that's not now. This is not that time we live in. This is the cultural milieu we are born in, we were born into, these are the problems that we have to deal with. And we can be sure that God had us born at just the right moment for this time. That he gave us the desires and the experiences, and he will keep giving us the wisdom for just this time. Second, this is just the right time for each of us individually in our relationship to Christ. There are not many people here that are not Christian. I hope and pray that there aren't any. But if there are, this is the right time to give your life to Christ. The worldly systems against Christ have not been more obvious than they are right now. When Jesus said, save yourselves from this evil and perverse generation, we tend to wonder, Jesus, haven't you seen our generation? How could that generation be more evil and perverse than this one? Obviously it was, because God said it. This is the time to be on the right side of Christ, to be with the people of God, to be part of God's kingdom. This is the time to be on the island. Swimming with the sharks will only get you eaten, as I said earlier. For those of us that profess Christ, and hopefully that's all of us, profess Christ, this is the right time to repent of your sin. It is the right time to let the truth of God's word Watch, wash over each one of us and make us more like Jesus. There is no time like the present. 
This is just the right time. And God's word tells us in Isaiah 55 that the time for repentance, the time for coming, coming to Jesus, may not be open forever. Isaiah 55 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will abundantly pardon him. Finally, knowing that God revealed his word at just the right time helps us in our prayers. Hannah prayed for a long time for a son before Samuel was born. Elizabeth prayed for a long time for a son before John was born. Anna and Simeon had prayed for all their lives to see the consolation of Israel, the Messiah, and were able to die in peace when they saw him. Some of us have been praying for a long time for relief from suffering and illness, a long time for loved ones that have gone astray. Some have been praying for a long time for relief in their family situation. This passage assures us that God does everything at just the right time, not too soon, not too late. Paul concludes his greeting to Titus with the familiar, familiar words of grace and peace. This was a common salutation to the ancients, but it means more to Titus, it means more to Christians on Crete, and it means more to us. God's grace is what has changed our stony, unbelieving hearts into hearts of flesh that love the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And only through that grace and reconciliation to God can we have any kind of peace. Peace with God and peace of conscience. The peace that is necessary to a new church whether it's on Crete 2,000 years ago or in Leavenworth, Kansas today. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it informs us. We thank you that it encourages us. We thank you that it rises, makes us rise up to the heavenly places to see you and to see Jesus Christ better. We pray that we would take these words to heart. We pray that we would learn from them, that we would follow them, and that we would be more conformed to the image of our Savior. And we ask it in his name. Amen.